Welcome to the Teapot Reads. My name's Sam. I'm the Teapot. This is what I'm currently reading and I'm so happy to see you today. Hello and welcome. I did a video like this last year and I really enjoyed doing it and found it also very helpful. Basically, it's a really nice touch base about halfway through the year to see what my top 10 are and my thoughts on them. And then at the end of the year, when I look at my like best books of the year, I will, I kind of start with my top 10. I'm like, what were my top 10 at this point? I, so, I mean, we're just going to get into it. There's not, there's not much else to, to kind of set this up. I have read Counting Manga, 53 books so far this year. And the vast majority of them are books and not manga. I didn't include any manga on this list. Um, and I only have like one classic. It's been a very heavy fantasy year. And I think that is going to continue because I'm very much in a big fantasy and especially like grimdark mood. So let's just get into it. Coming in at spot number 10 is Wild Sheep Chase by Haruki Murakami. This is not the only Murakami book that I have read this year. I read the first two little novellas in this series, which is called The Rat, I think is what the, the series is called. This is the first full length novel though. And when I was reading it, I was like, this is just some of the weirdest Murakami I've ever read. But it has left a absolutely indelible mark on me. And I find myself thinking about this book a lot. And I literally, I saw some sheep when I was, um, when I was on vacation in the UK, when I went to Stonehenge, there were sheep everywhere. And I generally love sheep. But it was like so close to having finished this book that I saw them and was <laughs> low-key triggered by these sheep just existing. And if a book impacts me that much, I feel like it has to make it to some degree onto a list like this and certainly last in my life. I was already a big fan of Murakami when I read this book. It didn't hurt that <laughs> fandom. It helped it in some ways, but it is it is probably one of his weirder ones. Uh, this whole concept is is odd. It's also, I want to say, his first novel that he wrote. I could be wrong. I know um, Hear the Wind Sing and Pinball. Um, is it Pinball 1978? I always forget the year. It, it doesn't say. Um, that one is, or those two are published and written prior to this one. But I think for full-length novels, I think this was his first. And you can tell that it very much is different from some of his later stuff. Not in a bad way, just enough. He's clearly still trying to find his footing. This is about our protagonist. He's unnamed. He is blackmailed into finding a sheep, a very specific sheep, with ties to the government. And it is sort of a journey about that but also very much a journey of friendship sounds corny but that is kind of what it is and also sort of a story of like midlife crisis or even quarter life crisis like just that crisis point you come to in your career and your life and it's very much fully realized with this novel in a very odd ephemeral way I really liked it. I did. I did really like it. I was reading it at the Arboretum for a little bit one day and was like, this is fucking weird. I feel weird, but I, I, I really did enjoy it. And it has a lot of those breathing space, quiet moments that I really find a lot of joy in, in Murakami novels. I think he does a really good job of it, but I think that this one, um, even though it was him finding his footing, had, it was no exception to that. It, ha it had some great moments. It doesn't have any of the really cinematic scenes that we get in some of his other books. Not that he's like a cinematic master, but there are images that tend to like strike you and sit with you for a while, like pinball, the scene where it comes into an arcade, kind of uh, like the, the, the scene near the end with all the, the, the pinball machines is so cinematic and just like breathtaking. This one doesn't really have that, but it, it sticks with you for the way things are set up and the way things resolve. And I have heard good things about the fourth one. I have it. Um, it is called something. I can't even see my books from here. It's, is it Dance, Dance, Dance? I think it's Dance, Dance, Dance. I do have it. I was going to read it quickly after this, but I have, like I said, been in just a big fantasy mood and I was kind of overwhelmed and hit a reading slump not long after this. Not related to this book though. Not related to this book. This book pff, fucking read through this so fast. I think it was like three days. It was 
you know, a lot. Coming in at number nine, I have A Taste of Gold and Iron by Alexandra Rowland. This is my Goldsboro edition. Um, so it's got the pretty edges. And does it have anything else going on? No, just the edges. I, when this came out last year, I knew I had to own it because it sounded 100% right up my alley, but I think I was really afraid to pick it up because it almost sounded like too perfect for me. This is about uh, Kadu. He is the, or Kedo, he is the prince, um, but his, his sister is like actually the, the, the ruler, the, uh, do they use empress? Is that the term? I believe. The queen. I guess they call her queen. I feel like she had another title as well. It's a mat. Okay. Off uh, side note. It's a, a matrilineal society and a matriarchal society. And I fucking loved that. That is something I've seen in a couple books this year. And actually another book that we're going to mention on this list. And I am just like obsessed with that setup for a fantasy world. It is so cool, especially because like the lineages are delineated via the, the mother. So uh, his niece, he is more um, of an important like politically structured person for his and like uh, even like culturally structured person for his niece than his niece's father is because it, the father is just like the body father and not actually married to the queen and um Kido being her uncle is directly related to her mother which is like the more important lineage it's, it's very interesting to me and I absolutely loved it and yeah you're actually going to see that exact same sort of thing in one of the books at, at later on this list but Kedo kind of makes it a mess of things with the body father of the princess so the the queen his sister her like lover <laughs> um sh he and the the body father who is a foreign diplomat get kind of into a scuffle and Kedo is the one who's found to be at fault and so he kind of takes his punishment and um ends up getting unfortunately a couple people killed because of it and He's, he's not like, he's very much an emotionally driven character. He did not want these people killed. He's very soft, seems almost like a weak term, but he is. He's soft and kind and gentle and actually has an anxiety disorder, which I could relate to on a huge level. I absolutely enjoyed that part because he has to get reassigned as guards. He's given Evamir, who is a kind of like prodigy at it, but this, he's never really guarded the, the royals. And... It's like a bodyguard romance. That feels like it's simplifying it so much, but that is like a major aspect of it and that is kind of how it's pitched. The fantasy world here in A Taste of Golden Iron is so rich and lush and I don't want to say unique necessarily, but it does. It does feel very unique. I have heard people say that if I liked this, I should read The Goblin Emperor, which makes me read want to read The Goblin Emperor even more because I really did enjoy this. There's a lot of intense world building and I would say that to some extent the plot actually takes a back seat to the world building sometime. I did not have a problem with that. I enjoyed really living here with these characters and exploring things and how the culture worked and how the society worked. It is a very politically driven plot but it's not a political fantasy. It's just that's the motivation and what is set up to be sort of a mystery like oh someone broke into this important building is actually kind of taking a backseat to the other political maneuverings that are going on and it's also very like finance based. There are some scenes in this book that made me go absolutely feral which I think is one of the reasons it made it onto this list. Even though I did love the world building I don't know if that would have been strong enough but they're they're towards the end so they would be spoilers so I can't tell you but there were a couple moments that I was like this this is like peak writing character writing. I'm in love absolutely in love and couldn't stop thinking about them. Absolutely fully recommend this if you like books like heavy with world building. I don't know if I... I feel like it fits kind of similarly uh, to A Strange and Stubborn Endurance by Foz Meadows which I did really like as well. So if you liked that you'd probably like A Taste of Gold and Iron as well as like Winter's Orbit and Ocean's Echo even though those are sci-fi I think they kind of fit similarly. Like I said people have compared the world building to Goblin em Emperor. So I, I guess I'll take their word for that. I don't think I've read too many things that read like this though. So it was really a unique experience for me that I could really enjoy. I had a bit of a run on romance this year so far. And I have a feeling, even though I'm in like a grim dark mood, I have a feeling I'm going to fall back into sort of romance, a wanting like romance soon. Although, I mean, they just, I don't know. I guess like I've got the urge. Okay. One of the books that I read and really enjoyed is, I would say, Romance First and, like, Fantasy Element Second, and that is Half a Soul by Olivia Atwater. This is an arc. 
I completely like skipped out on the opportunity to buy the fairy loot edition because I was like, mm, eh, I have an arc. I don't even know if I'm gonna like it. I loved it. I loved it so much. This is about um, a girl who I'm totally blanking on her names. I'm terrible with names. If this is your first time here, I'm so bad at remembering characters' names. So it's like a huge sign of adoration for a character when I do remember off the top of my head. I, they just don't stick and that is literally every book I read. I, while I'm reading it, totally fine. I could tell you about the characters in depth, but when I'm trying to recall details, nope. Theodora, she, yeah, that's her name, Dora. Dora has half a soul. When she was a child, she accidentally got into a little snafu where a fairy took half of her soul. And now an adult, her cousin who she is best friends with is out on the season and trying to get a match and it convinces Dora and um, her, the cousin's mother, so Dora's aunt, to go to London to try to snag her a match. But really it's to try to get Dora some help from the sort the Lord Sorcier, I think is what they call him, a very grumpy magician who's super powerful and does a miracle every day before breakfast, I think is like the catchphrase. It's cute. Of course, there's a romance between Dora and the Lord Sorcier, but it, it's got like enough angst to really like fill me up with joy and glee and enjoyment. And this is also obviously a Regency set novel, maybe not obviously, but it's a Regency set novel. So it's got those elements to it as well, which I really loved and I'm always really seeking. I am not a big Bridgerton book fan, but a big Bridgerton the show fan and actually do like historical romances. <laughs> wink, wink, there's one on this list. <laughs> That's not this one. So, you know, it filled a lot of those niches for me and what I love. I think the other thing that really makes this book stand out though is the depiction of the Fae and the magic system. More so the Fae, they are the dangerous, pesky, simpering, tricky Fae type and I love that. I live for that. As much as I like a good romanticy where the fairies are sexy elfmen, um, I actually prefer this kind of depiction of the Fae by a long shot. They are the tricksters of the world. They are a problem. They should be dealt with as such. Doesn't mean they can't be good guys or bad guys. It just means that they are also going to always fall in that morally gray self-serving category. And I love it. I am here for it. I was living for it. Especially Dora's depiction of having half a soul, which only really lets her experience extreme emotions. It worked so well for me. I wasn't sure how it was going to work, if it was going to come off corny, if it was even going to manage to withstand or sustain throughout the whole novel. It does. It's fantastic. And I do have the next two books. I did get the Fairy Lutes edition of those two, and I am looking forward to reading them. And the third one, I believe, is Sapphic, which is a bonus that I didn't even realize until I uh, the books arrived. And I was like, oh, how exciting. So I will probably be reading them this year. I, I don't see why I wouldn't. I don't see why I wouldn't at all. Maybe soon, actually. I might read, I think the next one is A Thousand Stitches. Uh, I would probably read that one soon. Number seven on this list is that historical romance I was talking about. This is Something Fabulous by Alexis Hall. I don't think it's Regency period, but I'm not 100% sure what period. Maybe, I don't remember if they say who the king is. Um, Maybe it is Regency. I literally don't. I don't know. Uh, it, it's definitely in that vein. It's a little more irreverent than something like um, Alexis Hall's A Lady for a Duke, which I think sticks more to that time period more strongly. This one does play a little fast and loose with it, but I love that. I was living for it. It's not enough to make you be like, that wasn't historically accurate. It was just enough for you to be like, oh yes, queer characters living their fullest, best lives. I am here for it. There is no strife. There is no trouble. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 not that there wasn't issue. Like, I don't want to make it seem like it's a queer normative society, but it was a very queer friend friendly society, which it wasn't not at that time period. It's a, I've, I've, mm, it just is a happy book, I think is what I'm trying to say. A queer happy book and, um, a time period when that wasn't necessarily the case for everyone. I loved this book. Valentin is a duke. If you didn't know, he's a duke. And he's been engaged to 
um, a like family friend's daughter, Arabella, for like ever, like ever. And then he like goes, his father is dead. Both of their fathers are dead and he thinks he's like fulfilling his father's wishes and her father's wishes by uh, being engaged to her. And so he goes and asks her to marry him and she runs away and he's like, well, fuck, we have to find her. So he and Bonnie, who is Arabella's brother, are they twins? I don't actually remember. Yes. Twin. Twin brother Bonnie. Bonaventure. I wasn't sure how I'd feel about the name Bonnie. Because it's spelled B-O-N-N-Y. Like, which feels very piratey, you know? But I, I didn't mind it. It grew on me really quickly. Um, is that how you actually spell Bonnie, though? I thought it was B-O-N-N-I-E. I don't know. It, it just looks very piratey. Um... So, so, Valentin and Bonnie take off chasing Arabella, and Valentin is, quickly comes to the realization that, oh, he actually likes boys, and particularly Bonnie, and it was just another really angst-filled book. The romance is obviously the central plot here. It is one of those books that I want to take off the shelf and read very specific chapters of, not the smutty ones. If... <laughs> If that's what you think I mean when I say that about books, it typically means the most, like, intense angst moments, not the, like, smut moments. I, I live for that emotional rush of characters meeting strife. This book kept going, though. It had a really fast pace. It wasn't always, like, surprising me, surprising me. Like, it wasn't, like, plot twist after plot twist after plot twist. It was just the pace it was going kept me on my toes, kept me engaged kept me wanting to know what would happen next and things were happening so quickly not in a bad way but things were happening so quickly that it allowed the book to continue to evolve in a really nice direction and I enjoyed it so much. I'm a big fan of Alexis Hall's writing in general which is not something I realized until fairly recently. I think last year I read A Lady for a Duke and like absolutely fell in love. I'm really excited for Mortal Follies. I have the Illumicrate edition coming so as soon as that lands with me I will be probably reading it immediately which is another sapphic historical romance like Long Shadow. Maybe I'll read them near each other. That would be kind of cute, yeah? And I just, I, the way he writes, especially the way he has characters talk about relationships and consent and coming to terms with relationships is very careful and gentle and enjoyable and something that makes me, as a reader of uh, romances, feel very safe and comfortable reading. It's a great communication. It doesn't take me out of the story at all. I have read some books. I do think consent's always an important topic, especially in romances. Although, you know, there's some dis suspension of disbelief and, and like, you, you let something slide in, in, like, guilty pleasures. But there are some romances I've read that make me very uncomfortable um, with a lack of consent. And then there are some romances that have, like, almost a, like, someone printed out a, like, how to form and just typed it in like verbatim dialogue that is just takes you out of the story and doesn't feel realistic to like that kind of situation at all but that that's not a problem here at all so yeah something fabulous it was fabulous and I cannot wait I have something spectacular and I'm kind of saving it because I'm not interested in really modern day romances so his geez oh, his most famous series which is boyfriend material um, just doesn't appeal to me the same way, uh, so I'm kind of saving something spectacular until I, well, I know I'm going to read Mortal Follies, like, right away, but after, after that, I'll probably keep continuing to save something spectacular until I have another of his books, uh, down the pipeline that I can be excited for. Coming in at number six, we have the only classic to have made it on this list. I really went into this year expecting to read more classics. It just hasn't happened yet. Oh, maybe. I don't know. This is Jane and Prudence by Barbara Pym. This is my first Barbara Pym book that I read and I am head over heels for her writing. It is amazing. It's very quaint. It's got a little romance to it. It's very clear. It really puts you in the setting and makes you feel like a hundred percent there and transports you. This is really like a slice of life almost. We have uh, Jane, who is... They, Jane and Prudence went to um, Oxford together, and it's sort of a divide between generations. They, they do have a, an age difference. Jane married a vicar, and she has settled down. She has a daughter who's actually going off to college herself at this book, and um, then Prudence, who is younger, is very much the modern woman. She hasn't settled down. She lives in London. She is maybe in love with 
someone it it maybe not you know is what's going on for her she she thinks she knows she doesn't know she's very taken through her by her emotions in a very volatile sparky way whereas jane thinks she is in control of her emotions but does sometimes let them get the better of her and it's just this slice of life watching these two women both interact with each other because jane is intent on getting prudence a husband but Jane is also settling down into this new community that she and her family have moved into. And Prudence is, I have that right, yeah. Yeah. Prudent, Prudence is the younger one. And and Prue is, you know, trying to figure out her own life in her own ways. Although I don't know if she'd describe it that way. I really enjoyed this. It, I think I've said that several times. It just, I think being so transported into the book and getting to see these women and their lives was so great and the writing just is the cherry on top it is clear concise and it doesn't make you real you don't realize you're doing heavy lifting while reading this book until you're done and you realize how much you got out of it so yeah Barbara Pym I hope to read more of her stuff this year I have a couple of her other novels on my shelf I don't 100% know if I'm going to get to them but I would like to coming in at number five is a book I just finished actually I think I finished it like two weeks ago if that that is Kushiel's Dart by Jacqueline Carey this is a political fantasy about Fira Nudalani I'm probably going to mispronounce literally every name in this book it's totally fine she is a prostitute basically but she's also raised to be a spy and she gets embroiled in a conspiracy that would dethrone the ruler of her country Terradange. This book, I knew I would like it for a while. I was waiting for these big paperbacks to come out and I'm a bit sad I did wait because I loved it so much. It is sort of the original format of romanticy which didn't even really exist. I, mm, this is one of those books, I think we're getting into the point of this video where describing why I like the books is going to get incredibly harder and harder because I just loved them all so much. So I think I'm just going to start listing reasons, some of them, not even all of them. They're, they're, I think everything moving forward is like a five star amazing read, except the honorable mentions. But I just, I don't, I couldn't like, I can't concisely be like, yes, it was this reason and this reason. These are just some of the reasons. We have a world that is so cool. It is basically Europe, but it's a very cool version of Europe. And if you think I'm joking, if you think I kid, this is the map. It's Europe. <laughs> Fidra is in Terre d'Anche, which is basically France. The in-world, current world building and happenings and politics and intricacies is so engaging. It is so surprising. Things happen, plot twists happen that are like George R. R. Martin levels of happening, but he would take a whole novel to get to this point. This novel just like burst through them. This felt like it could have been like three or four books if a different author was writing them. And I don't mean that as an insult to, ev to either like a George R. R. Martin writer or to Jacqueline Carey. It works really well for her writing, but it's, it's so jam packed with things. You can't look away from the page. And it, it for a like almost what is it uh, yeah like a 600 something page book it does not feel that heavy the mythology of this world which is kind of like a take on like christianity but goes for it's very interesting i really loved that it plays around with um almost like i don't know it, 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 it just it's interesting i really was feeling it it kind of gave me vibes of jay christoph's nevernight trilogy or even Empire of the Vampire. It's a very lush world with a really intricate mythology. It is a, for Terradange itself, is a queer normative world, and Phaedra is a character you'd probably classify as bi. I don't know if she would use that term. Um, she might also, you could classify her probably as pan. The side characters were all interesting. The most prominent side character is Jocelyn, who is a a guard basically and he's the reason they repackaged these books is because there is a novel coming out that's a retelling of his early life and this novel from Jocelyn's point of view which I would like to read at some point I want to read the whole trilogy though I think that the big big thing though is how good of a political fantasy it is 
there are so many characters and so many motivations and threads going on. It feels very realized and it feels very like I could dig my teeth into this for a while and not get tired of it. It's also a little like small pleasure. It's one of those fantasy books where if you were to at a certain point read out like a line or a description from the book or even just try to describe it to someone who had no idea what you were talking about, it would sound like you were talking in alien language. And I love fantasy books that are just so fully created that, you know, you, trying to talk to someone about it would require backstory. I just, I really love that. There was one in particular that really got me. Uh, this might be too far. I don't know if I could find it, but it, I was just like struck with how insane I would sound if I said it aloud. And I, I just, I was looking for it really great number four i'm actually reading the sequel right now uh, book one is little thieves by margaret owen this reads like a standalone so if you're not interested in the whole series don't feel like you have to invest but i loved this it is a retelling of the goose girl but it i hate the term subvert game of thrones ruined that for me but it is a very subversive story and it's you know tackling a lot of things and not just a fairy tale retelling you get the point of view from Vanya, who is the maid who steals the princess's face and her life. It's not only a really good retelling, it's a really good story, and it's a really good exploration of trauma. It's a YA novel, and that's, I think, really because of the character's ages. It's a, you know, it's more simplified, obviously, than Kushiel's Start. That thing is freaking intense and intricate, but it is not like, you know, it's not, it's like, I read Sorcery of Thorns recently, and that is a very simple why novel this this is doing more complicated things and it's great and can we take a moment to really appreciate the undercover which the um the author did did the undercover for painted devils which like i said i am reading now and i'm loving it i love her art so much things i loved about this book the characters vanya in particular is a really easy character to love she is one of those characters who is not a good person or even necessarily a nice person but has like so many traits that make you love her anyways probably mostly trauma built traits i think i'm just like really drawn to characters with extreme issues i really loved as well emmerich who is the one kind of trying to figure out what's actually going on he's a um prefect uh, a junior prefect right a, a junior prefect investigating the situation because there are some weird things happening at uh, Castle Reigenbach and um th there's romance there I I really liked the relationship between Emmerich and Vanya as well as the characters on their own and all the side characters especially Ragna was a surprise at how much I loved her I really thought she was going to be annoying with her introduction but I fully thought she was cool the world building also really good the premise of the low gods loved it thought it fit in really really nicely with the world building and allows almost like infinite stories you can play around a lot in this world I think the fact that it reads like a standalone but isn't a standalone is also really delightful it there's an opening at the end that doesn't make you feel like you have to read the next book like it doesn't leave things unanswered it is just like literally an opening that says if you want to follow these characters more absolutely however the book resolves everything it needs to resolve it, it, not everything because you know people aren't solved in a book but it resolves everything it needs to solve and i enjoyed that i really enjoyed having the option to continue or not after reading it though i was like of course i have to continue thank god it's a trilogy but i liked that it could stand on its own and i've seen some people say that they don't want to continue the trilogy because they are so satisfied with the ending and i fully agree i think that you can be super satisfied i think that's a really a great mark of a writer to be able to both conclude a story and continue it and satisfy well, I haven't finished Pain and Devils, but the way it's going, I think satisfy readers either way. Some honorable mentions before I get into the top three books I have read so far this year. I'm just going to go really quick through these. First is Trust of the Emerald Sea by Brandon Sanderson. This reminded me, I'm matching. This reminded me how much I actually like, like Brandon Sanderson's writing and how much I enjoy the Cosmere. This is a very cute kind of cozy fantasy-esque story with very heavy Princess Bride vibes. It is about Tress who goes on an adventure to rescue her a beloved 
and uh, becomes a pirate along the way. It's really great. This is the Dragon Steel edition. This is the Dragon Steel edition, which is just a stunning edition, and I am so happy with it. And if we can just take a moment to appreciate the art, the illustrations are done by Howard Lyon or Leon. And where where is she? Here, here is Tress. I love her. I had her set as the background on my phone for a while. The Unbroken by C.L. Clark. I actually read this very early in the year and kind of forgot it was this year that I had read it when I was putting together this list. This is a, another French-ish inspired fantasy series. I haven't read the next one yet, but I am hoping to get to it this year. It is about, um, well, it's an empire and terrain is part of the... Mm -mm, well, anyway, it's an empire. There's a revolution to basically free, you know, the people who actually live there from the <laughs> colonizers. You know, it's an anti-colonization story, but it is really intricate. I really liked that it doesn't pull punches. And I liked also, th this is such a small thing. I liked so much the descriptions of clothing in this book. Every time clothing was brought up, and I'm not a visual reader, every time clothing was brought up, I was living for it. But I really like that it didn't pull any punches, that it, not necessarily realistic because, you know, fantasy, but it did a really good job of showing just how fucking bad colonization is. And even the attempt to revolt and rebel, it's almost like colonization is... is like spiked. So when you're trying to pull it out, you know, like, or an arrowhead, when you're trying to pull it out, you're almost going to do a lot of damage, you know, maybe even worse damage because of how hard it is fighting. And that's sort of a hard thing to face that colonization not only fucks up at the beginning and the middle, but also the end. And there's a lot of recovery that has to happen. It's a brutal book. I don't know if I would call it grimdark, but it is definitely more on the brutal side of fantasy. Girls of Paper and Fire by Nat Natasha Wen. Is that how you say that name? I, for a while, I know, the only thing I didn't like about this book was like the fact that some of these people are like half animal. I had a really hard time getting my head around that. Otherwise, I thought this was really fantastic YA fantasy. It's brutal. It's dark. I would say it's on the same level of darkness as like Hunger Games where you don't always realize that what you're reading is something horrifying but is horrifying. I cannot wait to read the next two books. I think I just needed a breather after this one because it is a lot to take in. This is also the Illumicrate edition which has the covers the series deserves because James Patterson your covers are fucking hideous for it. I know he's not the one in charge of it. The paperbacks aren't even the same heights though. Okay. Anyway. And the final honorable mention is a little duet, which is a psalm for the wild built and a prayer for the crown shy, which are both by Becky Chambers. These are cozy sci-fi, cozy fantasy. They are about, the series is called Monk and Robot. They are about a monk, which the religion in this world, I really wish was the religion in our world because there's so much fulfillment there and the whole society within these books is just built up so beautifully about a monk who wants to cure crickets and about a robot who's the first robot to interact with humans in a very long time. Generations and generations and generations for both robots and humans. This takes place in a future world where the robots basically all woke up one day and gained consciousness and so humans were like we will divide this planet in two, we will not interact with you. We will stay out of your business because you deserve to be free independent beings and the robots went off into the woods and were never heard from again. But now we have a robot who is basically come out of the woods to see if humans are ready to continue or um where you begin contact with robots or if there's anything robots can do for them it's, it's it's really interesting it's really great on every level there's really wonderful conversations about gender and gender identity our protagonist is uh non-binary and uses they them pronouns and the robot uses it pronouns which is a huge and intriguing conversation that i absolutely was living for and loving and yeah the world is just really fun it's it's one of those cozies that you just want to sit and dream about living in this in this world now into our top three again these are going to be so hard to talk about because i just loved them loved them loved them coming in at number three we have Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies. This is the Fairy Loot Edition. I think this is the first book I actually finished this year, so what a great way to start the year. This is about Emily Wilde. She is a researcher and she's putting together her book, her Encyclopedia of Fairies. It's going to be the most complete book ever. She, uh, I think I said she's a professor. She goes to what is now Iceland to um, 
research the fae there and oh my goodness this is a light academia cozy fantasy what are we small hashtags no um but it, it does it, it has both those aspects also sort of a romance because it's um emily is quickly joined by her colleague wendell who is a pain in her ass but a delight on the page i couldn't stop thinking about this book after i finished it i think in real life i have given copies of this book to so many people because i'm just like read this book read this book read this book you'll fucking love it and it was just mm, delightful and delicious i loved the fae the descriptions of the fae you know again kind of going back to half a soul it has a really great portrayal of them in the way i really want where they're sort of feral in a way but they can be courtly and feral at the same time m is a really great character she is autistic coded and I really felt seen with her character and just so much she was doing and how she was acting and reacting and her almost like lack of understanding other people. I thoroughly enjoyed that. I really liked Wendell. I love how we go into the book and Emily is like, does not like Wendell and you get like this very particular impression of him and then he shows up and you're like, wait, he's great. <laughs> um, what the hell? It's really good. I was so invested in the characters in this book. I wish it was longer. I wish it was longer. I do because I just, anyway, cannot wait for book two, uh, Emily Wilde's Map of the Fairylands. I have copies pre-ordered. I'm excited. I'm so excited for it. I hope the series goes on forever, actually. I hope the series goes on forever. And it actually inspired me to read another Heather Fawcett book her out of green gables retelling for middle grade it was okay it was not the best thing i've ever read but i am happy to have it so it's good number two we have the witch king by martha wells i read this one or i finished this one really recently as well it struck such a deep chord with me it is a split timeline book we have part of it taking place in of the war against the hierarchs and then part of it taking place at the renewal of the successful um government's loyalty it is not a book that is easy to describe kai wakes up having been trapped and spends a lot of the current timeline figuring out why and how and who trapped him and tracking down his friends. The flashback timeline is the beginning of the resistance against the hierarchs. So it is almost taking place at two points in this world's history that matter, but only matter as hinge points and are not necessarily what other books would choose to focus on as important points in history because it is not the resistance it is the beginning of the resistance and it is not the reunification or whatever they call it it is literally happening right around it it is an angry book it is a hopeful book oh my gosh there were so many lines especially later in this book that made me cry because of how hopeful and beautiful they were. There's at one point a character, a bunch of the characters are going into something and the one character, you know, like you believe the characters may not make it. The characters believe they're probably not going to make it. And one character asks another, do you like, do you think we'll get out of this? And the other character like smiles and says, if we do, I've got plans. And I just thought that was the most beautiful, hopeful line I have ever read. So this book, it just, it just, it is massively emotional. Yeah, hard to talk about why I loved it so much. I think that, I think that hope plays a large part in it. I think that the scale of tragedy in this book also plays a part of it. It's not enjoyable to read about tragedy, but there is something to saying this juxtaposition of a character saying I've got plans and then literal decimation and whole cultures wiped out and concern that this kind of thing could happen again 
it is a hard book to read, but it is really rewarding for it. And I was already a fan of Martha Wells. I've read some of the Murderbot books. I had never read any of her fantasy. I can already tell you she is shooting to the very top of my favorite fantasy writers of all time. And a side note, this was something small but also really enjoyable. I really liked the sort of conversations this book can bring up about gender politics and gender identity and I don't know if queer normative is the right word for this world, but I think that is a better word than he like heteronormative. I don't think that's like the right description for it either. The magic system was also really fucking cool. So there's that. And then finally, the best book I have read this year will come as no surprise if you've been on this channel for a bit, because this is an author that I absolutely love. Every time I read one of her books, I love it. I fall in love. Which, can I just quickly see? I'm gonna count. How many of these are are female authors? <laughs> Seven female authors out of the ten. I believe Alexander Rowland is non-binary, and I don't think any of the other ones are. I believe Alexis Hall and Haruki Murakami both identify as male. So, yes. Seven of the ten. I read, I think I read predominantly female authors. That's not a bad thing. I'm not complaining. I'm not gonna change my ways and start reading like more men. But I, I just, interesting, interesting. Um, my favorite, my favorite book I've read this year, Fool's Errand by Robin Hobb. And I'm just going to lump in Golden Fool as well. Although of the two in the Tawny Man trilogy that I've read so far, Fool's Errand was the one I loved more. I will be reading Fool's Fate next. That is my next read after I finish Pain of Devils. I'm terrified. I'm terrified. This takes place after Live Ship. And I don't want to say too much because it would spoil or could spoil things in the original Farseer trilogy. Not so much Live Ship, but in the Farseer trilogy, we get to see a lot of characters we love. Obviously, Fitz is our protagonist. It is a sad book. It has some really emotional moments. It is also the first one is like it's such a small plot. It, it could have huge implications. And if things don't go well, because it is a quest plot, let's admit it's a quest plot. But if it didn't work out, the bad things would have happened. But it is such a small, like, I think it takes place over, like, the beginning takes place over a while. But the the bulk of it takes place, I think, over, like, a week or less. It's very quick moving. It is very character driven. I loved the character interactions. I loved Fitz in this book and his role in this book so much. And... I was like smiling the whole time I was reading it. I was, both of these, I read very quickly. They are chunky books. I think I read Golden Fool. Ooh, I think it was flying. Well, I read Golden Fool in about four days. They're just my bread and butter. I've, I feel like addicted every time I'm reading them. So they're I, perfect. I'm so terrified for Fool's Fate. I know there's literally, there's the Rain Wild are dragging keeper whatever that series is called and then also fits in the fool after that and supposedly robin hobb is working on another book because someone was like what's a certain character up to and she winky faced and it's like please <laughs> but that's it those are my top 10 of the year like i said i've read over 50 books including manga this year so yeah i have i've cut quite a large swath lately have you read anything really good have you fallen in love with any particular books? Are there any books I've recommended today that you want to read? I, if you are a fantasy reader, I strongly recommend Witch King. It is out now. It is just amazing, life-changing type of fantasy. And obviously I recommend Robin Hobb, but I would say start with Assassin's Apprentice. This series won't like fulfill even half of what you needed to if you don't have the buildup of Assassin's Apprentice and even Live Ship. Oh, but all these books are our recommendations. All of them are. If you are a subscriber, thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. And if you are new here, maybe consider subscribing. I would love to see you more regularly. I post weekly content and I hope, you know, I hope this year to start getting it up past weekly. Although I don't know. I don't want to overwhelm myself. Anyway, thank you for being here. If you're somewhere cold, I hope you're staying warm. If you're somewhere warm, I hope you're staying comfortable. And most of all, I hope you're reading a great book. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.